Paddington Station, terminus of the Great Western Railway, the London end of the line and wonder of the world, and all designed by me. All by me. Look, I'm over here. Not them. Do they look like the greatest of England's engineers? I'm over here. That's me. Isambard Kingdom Brunel, engineer. Pleased to meet you. I designed 25 railway lines, over 100 bridges, three ships, one field hospital, and eight dockyards. Not one for blowing my own trumpet much, but I'd say that's quite an achievement. And I'm also designer, architect, and chief engineer of Paddington Station. Come on, let's get on with it. There's so much to see. You know what annoys me about these passengers? Why do they never look up? Up there, it's truly amazing. Three gigantic spans, 189 iron beams, 69 iron columns erected in three rows, glass roof, feast your eyes. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. First, you need to know the brief. It's 1849. There's going to be a great exhibition here in London in two years' time. Crowds and crowds of people are going to arrive here. This is, after all, the London terminus of the greatest of all railways, the Great Western Railway, and people from all over the West will be arriving in style by state-of-the-art steam train. They'll be dressed in their best clothes, so we need to keep them sheltered. They'll need plenty of light, plenty of places to let out the smoke and steam, plenty of space for people to meet. It's got to be built to last, and we've got to think big. Our station has got to be bigger, better, and more graceful than the stations of our rivals on the Great Northern Railway. Oh, and you need to know the dimensions. A mere 700 feet long by 240 and a half feet wide. That's 213 metres times 73 metres to you. How would you design and build it? What materials would you use? Inspired by the Great Exhibition Hall at Crystal Palace, Brunel designed three massive sheds, each with a domed roof. A giant one in the centre with a span of 31 metres and two smaller side ones, the South Dome with a span of 20 metres and the North one with a span of 21 metres. The domes were strengthened with 189 iron ribs and the length of the structure was supported on 69 iron columns with diagonal braces to make the structure rigid. To let in the light, the roof was made of glass and to make it pleasing to the eye, patterns and decorations were incorporated into all of the ironwork. Paddington Station. Not one for blowing my own trumpet. Much. But I'd say that's quite an achievement. Come on, let's get on with it. The Great Western Railway was created by Act of Parliament in 1835 to construct a main line from London to Bristol, a distance of 190 kilometres. Brunel was appointed chief engineer, tasked with designing and building the whole route. OK, so here's the problem. We have a total budget of six and a half million pounds and we have to build the fastest railway from London to Bristol. Trains run fastest when they can go straight and on the level, so we have to engineer the straightest, flattest route that we possibly can. 
The trouble is, the land we have to cross is hilly, and there are lots of stroppy landowners in our way. How would you engineer the best route? What are we going to do? This is one of the big challenges I faced, the River Thames. Here at Maidenhead, it's 78 metres wide. London's on one side, Bristol's on the other, and the land slopes down to the riverbank on both sides. And there are two other important design considerations too. I want the bridge to look as beautiful as the river, but remember our budget. It must not cost a fortune. I want our passengers to have the perfect romantic ride like floating across the countryside. I don't want them to have to even think how we built it. And here's what I did. That's it, Maidenhead Bridge. Did you see it? No, you missed it. Hang on, hang on. OK, let's try again. Watch carefully. There, that low wall beside the track, that's the parapet of my famous bridge. You can hardly see it from the train, and that is what I mean by good design. Now, do you want to see it one more time? Brunel's bridge was unique. When it opened in 1838, its brick arches, each one 39 metres across, were the longest in the world. Being only 7 metres high, it was the flattest in the world too, and that was all down to money. Either side of the bridge, the railway had to be raised up on an embankment, which meant employing hundreds of workers, or navvies, to build it up by hand. The higher the bridge, the higher the embankment needed to be, the higher the embankment, the larger the number of navvies needed to build it. The larger the number of navvies, the higher the wage bill. Put simply, the lower the bridge, the lower the costs. The graceful bridge Brunel designed was so strong, it's still in use today, carrying express trains travelling at 200 kilometres per hour. Not one to blow my own trumpet, often, but I'd say that's quite an achievement. And so Brunel continued to engineer his route through Reddin, Didcot and Swindon, keeping the track as level as he could, building up embankments to cross areas of lower land and excavating cut-ins through higher ground. Between Chippenham and Bath, we face another problem, Box Hill. It's 10 kilometres long, 2.9 kilometres wide, and 130 metres high. Oh, and our precious passengers are scared of holes in the ground. But I've got a plan. He could have diverted the line, winding around the hill, but that would have increased the journey time, and Brunel's love of straight lines led him to engineer what was then the longest railway tunnel in Europe. It's 2.9 kilometres long, dead straight, and took five years to build. It is said that the navvies used a tonne of gunpowder to blast the rocks away and a tonne of candles to see what they were blasting every week. As to his concerns that the passengers of the day were frightened of tunnels, he built the tunnel entrance over twice the size of a train. So that the hole didn't look so small and scary to timid passengers. Not one to blow my own trumpet, well, only a little, but I'd say that is quite an achievement. From Box, the line runs down through the city of Bath and, following the valley of the River Avon, winds on towards Bristol. A short section, only 19 kilometres in length, with five tunnels, high embankments and many bridges. Mm -hmm. 
Bristol Temple Meads. The end of our journey. My most famous design is right here in Bristol. Do you want to see it? Come on, let's get on with it. It's 1830, and there's a competition to build a bridge across the Clifton Gorge. Those cliffs are 76 metres high, and the gorge is over 200 metres wide. No one has ever built a span that long before. There are lots of people saying that it can't be done. But what would you do? What would you design? And what materials would you use? Aged just 24 years old, Brunel won the competition with his ingenious design for the Clifton Suspension Bridge. The road is suspended underneath six giant wrought iron chains, three on each side of the road. Anchored deep into the rocks on either side, the chains rise to saddles high up in the towers, stretch down to their lowest point in the centre of the bridge, then rise up and over a saddle in the tower on the opposite side and down to another anchor. The whole structure is designed so that it moves as vehicles cross. Apart from minor additions, like putting tarmac down over the original wooden planking, the bridge is still as Brunel designed it over 175 years ago. Speaks for itself, doesn't it? Not one to blow my own trumpet. Well, only on weekdays. But I'd say that's quite an achievement. This is my boat, the SS Great Britain. Do you like it? At the time of her launch in 1843, she was the largest ship in the whole world the first ever iron-hulled, ocean-going steamship. She was launched with much fanfare. But the SS Great Britain was in fact so large that she couldn't fit through the locks from Bristol Harbour out onto the river. So Brunel had the locks especially widened. And a year later, she left Bristol for Liverpool, where she made her maiden voyage to New York in August 1845. OK, I wonder if you could help me out here. We've got 252 first and second class passengers booked for our next voyage. Liverpool to Melbourne, Australia. They're all waiting to board, but first we've got to load their luggage and heavy cargo, and we haven't got a crane. How would you design and build one? How are you with cogs, gears and pulleys? Have a go. It would be great to hear some trumpets blowing. If you want to design a crane or learn more about Brunel's work, why not visit Brunel's Britain, a specially designed online resource available free to Teachers TV viewers.